what we need to do to make wise decisions. You know, I, we make decisions 24-7 over some are big decisions, some are small decisions, but we are constantly making decisions. We're going to be studying this morning, um, let me get to the right page, Proverbs chapter 3. Proverbs chapter 3. Now, Proverbs chapter 2 uh, deals with more of the outer life of what a believer should be. But chapter 3 is, is all about what we are on the inside. And you know, folks, it's always the best when what we are on the outside agrees with what we are on the inside. But that's not always true. And that's one reason God told us not to judge people, because all we can judge by is that outward that we see, and God is the righteous judge that judges us by what he sees on the inside, what he sees in our heart. So uh, he said, since you can't do it right, because you don't have all the information that you would need to do that, nor can you possibly, he said, I'll just relieve you of that obligation. You don't need to judge each other, ever not your job. If God tells me that I don't have to judge somebody, you know what that does for me? It frees me up to love them no matter what. I don't have to judge them. I don't have to judge the sin in their life. I don't have to condone it or not condone it. You know, you hear people say, well, if you are friendly or if you then you're just condoning what you know. No. It's not up to me to condone or not condone sin in your life. It's not up to me to judge sin in your life. Listen, I've got plenty right here that keeps me busy enough. And the Bible says if we'll judge ourselves, then we won't have to be judged. So if you want to judge somebody, look in the mirror and go at it. Because you know who you are. But, folks, judging other people because of what... Of whatever they do that you don't agree with, no. Everybody's an individual, everybody has a relationship, and he is the perfect judge. And he is the merciful judge. And I might tell you, we're not always merciful when we judge. But God will show his children mercy, aren't you glad? I'm glad God shows us grace and mercy. I need that. And you do too. So, but God looks at what we are on the inside. And that's what this lesson is about. He's, uh, uh, Proverbs was written by uh, Solomon, is known as the wisest man ever. Never has been, never was anybody before him as wise as he was. Never been anybody since him as wise as he was. But listen, when God asked him what he wanted, he asked for wisdom in ruling the people. And that's where God blessed Solomon with wisdom beyond, almost beyond human measure. He wasn't so smart at home. You read about his wives and his concubines and how he allowed uh, them to bring their idols and their gods into Israel. Uh, his relationships with his sons and his children. He wasn't as wise at home as he was on the job. But in his wisdom, he penned chapter 3 that we're getting ready to read. But folks, remember, we, we know this. Who's the author of the Bible? Is Solomon the author of Proverbs? No. He's the writer of Proverbs. Who is the author of the whole Bible? The Holy Spirit is. Yes, God is. So if God is the author, he, the Holy Spirit, told Solomon every word to write. So, you know, we take this as advice from Solomon. Well, we better take it as advice from God because the whole Bible was penned the Bible tells us by the by God moving on the Holy Spirit moving on holy men of God and telling them exactly what to write. And that's why this book is so remarkable. One of the reasons. God using forty different men to write it, and yet it agrees. A period of sixteen hundred years and something written 
at the beginning and something written 1,600 years later still agrees. Why? Because the Holy Spirit makes it agree. You couldn't get 40 men to agree on what they had for breakfast. Women either. That wasn't a slam to men. <laughs> it was to anybody. Because we, we see things differently. We remember different things. And um, so anyway, this chapter is saying what we need to be all the time on the inside will help us to make wise decisions. Verse number one of chapter three says, My child, never. Those words like all and never, pay attention to them. It says never. It means not right now, not in the future, never, ever forget the things I have taught you. Store my commandments where? In your heart. You see, a lot of us have his commandments in our mind. But he said, move them from your mind to your heart. Have my commandments in your heart. Why? For they will give you long and satisfying life. Don't you love days when that are just satisfying? It's a simple word, but it's a good word, isn't it? Just where you feel satisfied. You don't feel in turmoil. Verse number three. Never let. There that word is again. Never. So it means not now. Not in the future. Not ever. It says never let loyalty and kindness get away from you. You got a friend. You be loyal to that friend. You got family. You be loyal to that family. You got a spouse, you be loyal to that spouse. The people in your life, you be loyal to them. And be kind. Folks, when we live in an age, and, and haven't every one of you told your children or your grandchildren at some point, you know what? You can be anything you want to be. So let me tell you something. Let's tell our children. If you can be anything you want to be, choose to be kind. Don't ever let kindness get away from you, the verse says. Wear them like a necklace. Okay, I've got on a necklace. Okay, wear it like a necklace. Now, Mona, stand up and turn around to face the crowd. Mona has on a necklace. A necklace. <laughs> It says, it says, wear loyalty, wear loyalty and kindness, wear them like a necklace. What does that mean? It's right there for everybody to see. It's right there for everybody to see that you're loyal to those that you love. It's right there for everybody to see that you're kind to whomever you come in contact with. It says, Write them deep within your heart. Not just in your mind, not just head knowledge, but write them, the things I've taught you, write them deep in your heart. Verse number four says, then, when you write them deep in your heart, then you will find favor with both God and people, and you will gain a good reputation. Folks, can I just tell you something? Christians should have a good reputation. If, if you work in an office and you're maybe the only Christian there, you should be the hardest worker there. There shouldn't be anybody in that office outwork you. You should have a good reputation. What all does that entail? It entails a lot of things. Pay your bills on time. A lot of things build your reputation. And when you have a reputation, a good reputation, then that's a good representation of the one who lives in you. Verse number five, trust the Lord with all your heart. How much? That means that you can't, you can't curtain off a little section there where you know something bad's going on, but you just want to curtain off that little bitty spot. Now, God can have the rest of it. 
but I just want to curtain off this little spot, something I know shouldn't be there, something I know should get rid of, something God, the Holy Spirit has convicted me of. But you know what? I'm just not ready to get rid of that. Well, let me tell you something. That's not trusting the Lord with your whole heart. When you trust the Lord with your whole heart, you'll remove the curtains and say, there it is, it's ugly, but I know you see it, and I want you to help me with it. I want to give you my whole heart. I want to trust you with my whole heart. Now, folks, when we trust him with our whole heart, it means we trust him with our loved ones. I told Doyle not too long ago that I had prayed for somebody during the daytime. And I said, Doyle, if I go to bed and I lay there, you know how you really start thinking about stuff when you go to bed, don't you? Boom, your mind gets to going. And uh, I used to know a sweet lady that said it's when she did her best thinking. Well, that's not when I do my best thinking. It's when I do my worst thinking. But I told Doyle, for me to go to bed and lie awake, worried over that, says I have no confidence at all in the prayers I prayed when I was wide awake. We pray when we're wide awake, my friend, when you get ready to go to bed, you trust that the God you prayed to when you were wide awake in the daytime, the God you prayed to is working in that situation. And you have placed them, the situation or the person in his hand. And you know what that means? You can turn over and go to sleep. Because God doesn't need you awake helping him. You can just turn over and go to sleep because you've prayed about that. You've given it to the Lord. And that's where we need to leave it. So trust in the Lord with all your heart. So you trust Him with all of your children, your grandchildren. Now we're getting on shaky ground now, aren't we? We want to worry about our kids and grandkids. No. No. Trust Him to the Lord. The Lord's the one that can take care of them. The Lord's the one that can know, knows it all and knows what to do. You and I do not. So pray for them? Absolutely. Commit them to the Lord? Absolutely. And then trust God that He's going to work in their situation. And so trust in the Lord with all your heart. It also means if you're going to trust Him with all your heart, you have to trust Him with all your circumstances. Everything that happens to you, you've got to trust Him with all of that. Good things happen to you, you've got to trust Him through that. See, I tend to think we're on a little bit more dangerous ground when good things are happening to us than we are when bad things are happening to us. Because when bad things are happening to us, we turn to the Lord. When good things are happening to us, we need to be careful. And we need to turn to the Lord. We need to trust Him with all of our circumstances. And folks, I'm going to really start meddling now. We need to trust Him with our finances. And I'll show you why in just a minute. But let's finish this first. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not depend on your own understanding. You know, we say, well, I don't get it, therefore I'm, I'm agitated about it. I don't understand it, so I'm, I'm just stirred up inside because I don't understand it. Listen, even if you think you do understand it, don't trust it. Don't trust in your uh, own understanding. Seek, verse number six, seek his will in all. There's another one of those words. What does all mean? I draw a box around it every time I see it in scripture. Because it says, seek his will in all that you do, and he will direct your path. What does it mean that God will direct our path? It means that God will set a straight path for us, and then he will enable us to walk it. It's not a matter of us being able to walk the path that God has laid out for us. It's a matter of God enabling us to walk the path that he has laid out for us. So seek his will in all that you do, and he will... Okay, there's another one of those words. He will. Not he might, or sometimes he might. No, he will direct your path. Verse number seven. <laughs> Don't be impressed with your own wisdom. Don't 
you find people that are impressed with their own wisdom, boring, annoying, and a lot of other adjectives that we could put on that. People that are impressed with their own wisdom usually don't have very much. Don't be impressed by what you know or what you think you know or even what you do. Don't be impressed with your own wisdom. Now let me tell you something. If there was not a danger of we Christians, of us Christians doing that, that verse wouldn't be in there. There's a danger that we do that. Because he said, don't do it. So if there is a danger, we need to watch out. We may be doing it and not knowing we're doing it. Don't be impressed with your own wisdom. Instead, fear the Lord and turn your back on evil. You know, the psalmist said, I'll set no evil thing before my eyes. He said, I'll turn away my eyes from beholding vanity. Remember that the next time you think you're going to a movie or watching something on television. I tell you, I had that frame sitting on our television for years, that, those two verses. And uh, when, when the show comes on and there's something on there that is vanity, then the psalmist said, I will set no wicked thing before my eyes. He said, I don't need to see that stuff. He said, I'll turn away my eyes from beholding vanity. Because you see, we get that stuff in our mind. And it's easy to get something in your mind, but it's, you can't get it out. That's the problem. He said, turn your back on evil. Then, then, when you turn your back on evil, then you will gain renewed health and vitality. You know what? <clears throat> Such trust in the Lord leads to our own well-being. We'll be healthier. You all, we've all, we all know what stress does to people. You know, I, I was pretty old before I ever heard the, when I was young, I didn't hear the, I'm, I'm stressed out. Well, I think there were times we were stressed out, but we didn't know what it was, so we didn't deal with it in the same way. But if you're not stressed out and you turn your back on evil and you fear the Lord, he says, then you will gain renewed health and vitality. You will actually feel better. Verse number nine, honor the Lord with your wealth and with the best part of everything your land produces. Honor the Lord with your wealth. And if there's anything that, uh, it, it's a hobby horse with me, it's for any American to say, I'm poor. Take a good long look at the rest of the world, folks. Okay, but honor the Lord with your wealth and American people. Not the ones who have just have the most. American people who have the least have a lot more than people in other countries do. And don't, let's not forget, God's looking down on the whole thing. Those who much is given, much will be required, the Bible says. So honor the Lord with your wealth. And the best part of everything your land produces. Israel, when they, God had said there will be a descendant of David on the throne of Israel forever, and then not only was the throne destroyed, Israel was destroyed. There was no throne of Israel. So they began to doubt what God had said. You know, they began to doubt God. And they still kept up the rituals. You read all this in Malachi. They still kept up the rituals, and they still offered their sacrifices. But you know what? They were bringing the runts. They were bringing the sick, the diseased. This one isn't good for anything, so let's just give it to the Lord. And you know what the Lord said? 
he said to Israel, give them to your governor if he wants them, but I want to tell you something, I do not want them. Unless you're going to give me the best you've got, don't give me anything because I won't take anything less. So folks, we need to honor the Lord with our wealth. One way of doing that is tithing. And I'll show you why in a minute. I've had people when I talked to them about tithing or taught a, a lesson on tithing or taught what the Word of God says about tithing, I, I could tell you the number of times I've heard this statement, I would like to, but we cannot afford to tithe. I have a pat answer to that. If you're a believer, you can't afford not to. And I'll tell you, well, it's right here. Honor the Lord with your wealth and the best of everything your land produces. Then he will fill your barns with grain and your vats will overflow with the finest wine. God blesses givers. And if you go to Malachi, I believe it's in chapter 3, uh, it says that when we give back to the Lord, then he will open up the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing on us that we hardly be able to receive. It will be so great. He said, I'll cause what you do to prosper. That's not why we give. We give because we love the Lord. And a tithe is taught in the Old Testament, and it's 10%. And I heard a pastor was asked one time, is that 10% of the, the gross or 10% of the net? And he said, well, son, do you want to be blessed on the gross or the net? So God blesses, give, and folks, everything you have is his. You say, no, I, made my, I worked hard and made my own money. I bought what I bought. That's all me. No, it's not. God gave you the health to do what you did. He gave you the ability to do what you did. He gave you the job that you had. And all of those things he could have taken away at any time. So anything you possess is because God has given it to you. And it is all his. And he said, I just want you to give back in the Old Testament. He says, I want you to give back 10%. Keep 90. Keep 90%. It's yours. But that 10% is mine. So give that to me. Now, why did God do it? Because God needed our 10%, really. God needed that to further the gospel and to do all the work that it does when we tithe to the church. Really? You think God needs what we can give? Mm -mm. In fact, let me tell you something about God. He has no needs. If God had a need, any need, then he's not who he says he is. He's not the God he says he is. God has no needs. He doesn't have a single need that I can fulfill. He has things he wants me to do. He doesn't need me to do them. And I have said several times, tithing's taught in the Old Testament. It's not taught in the New Testament. I give you that. It isn't. No, in the New Testament it says... Give to the Lord as he has blessed you. Folks, let me tell you something. The percentage just went up, not down. He's not saying, when you give as the Lord has blessed you. Wow. Well, anyway, if you have any questions about any of that, ask me. But God blesses givers. He has promised to bless givers. Be generous. Not just to the Lord, but we'll see in a minute. Be generous to people. I remember when I read, first read the verse, work so that you'll have money to give to help others. And I remember the first time I studied that verse. I mean, I've had a dialogue going with the Lord, but I said, Lord, why don't you just tell them to work? But that's not what he said. Of course, he's speaking to every believer. So I guess he was telling all of us. But instead of telling me to work, to have to give to them, what's, what's the point of telling me to work so I'll have to give to somebody that doesn't have? So, but you know what? God said that. He said, you work. And you work hard so that you will 
don't have the finances to help somebody else that's in need. And if you're the person that receives the help when your finances straighten out, you be the one to help somebody else. Don't be tight-fisted. Be generous. Verse 11, my child, don't ignore it when the Lord disciplines you. Anybody ever been disciplined by the Lord? It is not pleasant. And if I was to stand here and, say, and tell you, I love it when the Lord disciplines me. I would not be telling you the truth. It's not pleasant. Ask your children and your grandchildren, was it pleasant when you got spanked? No. Was it beneficial? Yes. My child, don't ignore it when the Lord disciplines you and don't be discouraged when he corrects you. For the Lord corrects those he loves. Just as a father corrects a child in whom he delights. Do you know the Bible says that if you don't discipline your children, you don't love them? I didn't say that. The Bible says it. Discipline is important in the life of a little person and discipline is important in our lives as well verse number 13 happy is a person who finds wisdom and gains understanding okay that there's a benefit what is the benefit of finding wisdom and gaining understanding happiness you'll be happy 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 being happy I might add is a choice that you make every day you I've seen people in terrible circumstances and that there's they still maintain a happiness about them and I've seen others just go off the edge when they break a fingernail you know it's just we have a choice we have choices to make that no matter what our cir circumstances are we can choose happiness happiness is a choice verse number 14 for the profit of wisdom is better than silver, and the wages are better than gold. Wisdom is more precious than rubies. Nothing you desire can compare with her. Wisdom. And where do we get wisdom? Where else do we get wisdom? James 1, 5, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God who gives to all men liberally and will never rebuke you for asking. You want wisdom in making your decisions? Ask God for it. He said, I'll give it to you every time you ask me. Anytime you ask me for wisdom, I'll give it to you in abundance. All you have to do is ask me. If you don't know what to do, you're making a decision, you don't know what to do, he said, ask me for wisdom in your situation. I'll always give it to you. And I, God said, I will never rebuke you for asking. God is pleased when we ask for his wisdom. And because it pleases him, he always gives it to us in abundance in that situation. Now, it's not a blanket wisdom. I've often thought, I'd like to pray, Lord, just make me wise in, all, in everything I do, in all my situations, just to help me to always be wise, but it doesn't work like that. If any of you lack wisdom in whatever circumstances you're in, whatever decision you're making, he said, ask me. We can gain knowledge from books. We get wisdom from God. It says... That's better than silver. It's better than gold. You know, there was a time when silver was more valuable than gold. I just thought you might want to know that. But I think that's why at this time silver was listed first. Okay, it's more. It's better than silver. Uh, its wages are better than gold. More precious than rubies. Nothing you desire compares with that. What in the world does that mean? 
It means if you have wisdom, if you ask God for wisdom, I'll bring it down to where the rubber meets the road here, you'll buy a house that you can afford to pay for. You'll drive a car that you can afford to drive. Why? Because wisdom helps you to make decisions so that you don't overextend yourself. So wisdom will help you make decisions where you don't have to lay in bed at night wondering how you're going to make the mortgage payment. Wisdom will give you wisdom will make you wise in your decision so that the things you do don't cause an extra burden on you. She offers you life in her right hand and riches and honor in her left. She'll guide you down delightful paths. I like that word. I don't hear it very often, but I think I'm going to start using it more. So if you hear me use it, I like it. Delightful. That is delightful, isn't it? It said she will guide you down delightful paths. Why? Because you're not constantly worried about how you're going to pay for what you've got or what you're going to do in your circumstances. Wisdom helps you to make right decisions, and right decisions take stress out of your life instead of adding more of it in. So, delightful. Because you've made wise decisions. You haven't overextended yourself. You haven't maxed out credit cards. And if you have done any of that, listen, it's not too late. Ask wisdom from the Lord. Ask Him to help you straighten it out. I firmly believe that if your finances are in the worst mess and they're just constantly a burden to you, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God. Go to God and say, I messed up. My finances are a mess. I made bad decisions. I need help. And then whatever the Lord leads you to do, that's what you do. But God helps us in all of those situations. And we'll just ask him. And then he said he'll guide you. Wisdom will guide you down delightful paths. Why? Because you're not all stressed out. Because you've used the wisdom that God gave you and you've made good choices. And good choices lead to delightful paths. All her ways are satisfying. Wisdom is a tree of life to those who embrace her and happy are those who hold her tightly to make better and wiser decisions. Verse 19, by wisdom the Lord founded the earth, by understanding he established the heavens. By his knowledge the deep fountains of the earth burst forth and the clouds poured down rain. My friend, if he can do all of that, he can take care of you. I read that and I think if God can do all of that, I read about creation and where God spoke it into existence. Genesis 1 and 2, 3, all through there. God spoke this earth into existence. If he can do that, he can take care of you, whatever your circumstances are, whatever you're going through. He is able. My child, don't lose sight, verse 21. My child, don't lose sight of good planning and insight. Well, I'm just going through life and happy to be there, just letting life happen. Whatever happens, happens. Good planning. Plan your work and work your plan. Plan. If you don't plan, life is going to just happen to you. It sometimes does even when we do plan, but at least we've got a plan. Don't lose sight of good planning and insight. Hang on to them. Why? For they will fill you with life and bring you honor and respect. They keep you safe on your way and keep your feet from stumbling. Wonderful promises. You can lie down without fear and enjoy pleasant dreams because you've made wise decisions. Because you've sought the wisdom of God and you have the things He taught you deep in your heart. You know what the Bible says? Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Think back on your conversations in the past couple of days or the past week. Uh, you 
spoke out of the abundance of your heart, whatever it was, because the Bible says, out of what's in your heart, what's deep in your heart, your mouth speaks. Twenty-four, you can lie down without fear and enjoy pleasant dreams. Twenty-five, you need not be afraid of disaster or the destruction that comes upon the wicked. Why? Oh, and this is important. I drew a box around this whole thing. For the Lord is your security. Your security is not in your job. Your security is not in the people in your life. Your security is in the Lord. He will keep your foot from being caught in a trap. Verse 27, do not withhold good from those who deserve it when it's in your power to help them. If you can help your neighbor now, don't say, come back tomorrow and then I'll help you. If you can do it now, do it now. Dwell and I have used that as a slogan. We heard it when we had only been married a, a short time. Somebody told us uh, that in their business that their slogan that they worked by was, do it now. If you've got something to do, do it. Do it now. So it says here, do it now. Don't say, oh, well, tomorrow I'll try to help you. No, if you can do it now, do it now. Verse 29, do not plot against your neighbors. And that's not just the person that lives next door to you. The Bible is very plain that your neighbors are are all the people that you come in contact with. Do not plot against your neighbors, for they trust you. Don't make accusations against someone who hasn't wronged you. Don't gossip. And let me tell you, be very careful what you say about the ones who have wronged you. Because God said, vengeance is mine, and I will repay. So we need to be careful about the things that we say. And that's not that we can't talk to friends about things that are going on. Please, no, no. it's good to talk to people. I am not saying that. But this says, don't make accusations against someone who hasn't wronged you. Just because maybe you don't want somebody else to like them, you just make up a little ditty, and it's not even true. But you say it anyway, really. an unruly tongue you got going on there. We need to try to control our tongue, James tells us. Verse 31. Do not envy violent people. Don't copy their ways. The Bible says that when we live with an, it says don't live with an angry person lest you learn their ways. So when you're in constant companionship with a person who is basically angry. The Bible says it rubs off. 'Such wicked people are an abomination to the Lord, but he offers his friendship to the godly. A friend of God, what better friend could you have? 33. The curse of the Lord is on the house of the wicked, but his blessing is on the home of the upright. Verse 34. The Lord mocks at mockers, but he shows favor to the humble. And verse 35. The wise inherit honor, but fools are put to shame. All of those showing contrast. And what, what the Holy Spirit is telling us to do is... Remember all the things I taught you. Put them deep in your heart so that when it comes time to make a decision, you will speak and act out of what's deep in your heart. Isn't that sweet promises he makes to us? He gives us such, uh, oh, I can't think of that word, but everyday advice. You know, the Bible is just full of God telling us what we just need to do in our everyday lives. How we need to live our everyday lives. This uh, third chapter of Proverbs was full 
of things that we need to do in our everyday lives. It's how we need to live our everyday lives. Folks, we live our everyday lives for Jesus. Having what we know about Him deep in our hearts so that when our mouth speaks, it will speak out of His wisdom, out of His love, out of His commands. And those things that we know about Him that are deep in our heart, they will affect what we say. They will affect how we live. They will, it will affect the decisions that we make. It will help us to sleep well at night and have pleasant dreams. Folks, the life that we live for the Lord, He tells us how to live it. And can I tell you something? There were some of these things that I taught to you today that when I was studying, the Lord taught them to me. And there's a few things if I had it to do over, I, I would do differently. I don't have a lot of decisions in my life that we've made that, that I would do any differently, but I thought of some of those little things. And I thought, yeah, you know. So I, I did not read this, study this, or teach this without some conviction in my own heart. But I'm grateful for that. Don't despise it when the Lord chastises you. Don't, don't despise it when the Lord shows you an area that, hey, I want to help you. You can do better here. And I want to help you do it. Don't despise the Lord for that. Embrace it and embrace Him and let Him help you. Some of the things that I've said here, we fail. I fail. Oh, but I have a God that if I'll ask Him, He'll help me. If I just turn to Him, He'll strengthen me. And He will, you too. Aren't you glad that we have a God that says, I want to be a part of your life. I want to be involved in the decisions that you make. I want to tell you how to live daily life. I want to teach you how you, how you can have a delightful path. How you can de-stress your life. And folks, I'm telling you what. God never intended for us to live under stress. He said, laughter is good medicine. Tell us happy and to rejoice. Not live all stressed out. And sometimes we can get so busy that we don't stop at any time for the Lord. Can I tell you something? If you're that busy, you're too busy. opinion. There came a time in mine and Doyle's life when God said to us, we need to cut some things out. And some of them are big things. But you know, we cut them out, we never looked back and never regretted it. Because it freed up our time for our family and for our church and for those that we love. So if God tells you to give up something, you know, oh no, I can't do that. Just do it. And see if, if he doesn't give you Heavenly Father, we're so grateful that you are a God that wants to be involved in our lives and will be as involved as we'll let you. We're so grateful for that. And Father, it humbles us to even think that the God of the universe wants to be a part of my life. But you have told us over and over and over that that is the case. You want to be a part of Brenda Lane's life. Thank you want to be a part of everybody's life that is here. All those that, that hear your word, you want to be involved in our lives. Thank you for that, Heavenly Father. And Lord, may you help us to be who you want us to be and forgive us, Father, when we fail you, even though those times are many. We just ask for your forgiveness and we're thankful to know that you forgive us. That Jesus died on the cross to take away our sins and you freely forgive us. We're so grateful for that. We love you, Father, and pray that you would teach us day by day from your word exactly what you want us to be. We ask it in Jesus' name.